Today we're going to talk about a specific condition called atrial fibrillation, which is very common, but it's really just one type of a heart condition. Uh, and of course, many of you maybe have had to deal with heart issues yourself, or perhaps you're here uh, because you've had a family member with cardiovascular issues. Uh, but regardless, you probably know that there's really a spectrum of a lot of different heart conditions that we deal with, you know, in cardiology and, and in, in, in our patients uh, as well. Uh, atrial fibrillation belongs to the group of conditions called uh, irregular heart rhythms. Uh, we use the word arrhythmia, which is a fancy way to say that, that it's an irregular heart rhythm. That means it's an electrical rhythm that's not normal. And atrial fibrillation is an important type of irregular heart rhythm amongst many types. Uh, but the reason it's so important is that, number one, it's common, uh, so we have to be familiar with it, and it can lead to complications if it goes untreated. Um, and that's why we wanted to focus on that today. And as Kelly said, you know, we'll spend about probably 30 minutes talking about atrial fib and some other heart issues as well. We'll talk about how we diagnose it, what it actually is, we'll talk about how we treat it, and we'll talk a little bit about prevention. And then, as she mentioned, we'll really have a lot of time today to uh, answer any questions you have, because I'm sure you'll have some, either about atrial fib specifically or about heart disease in general. So we do want to thank uh, our sponsoring organization for helping uh, put, put this on, along with the American College of Cardiology. So uh, as I mentioned, these are some of the topics we're going to talk about. We're going to explain what atrial fibrillation is. We're going to talk about, you know, your healthcare team that you can use if you have this condition or someone in your family does. Uh, and then we'll talk about treatment, how we uh, manage if we have, uh, you know, atrial fib that's persistent, it becomes a chronic issue. Uh, and then we'll talk about information for uh, caregivers and some other resources as well. So uh, as I was saying, you know, atrial fibrillation is really one type of irregular heart rhythm, which we call arrhythmias. Uh, and it's actually the most common type in the United States. Uh, and as the slide shows, you know, there were many, many cases of atrial fib. And of course, if you or your family members have had to deal with this, you know about how common it is. Um, and unfortunately, the incidence is actually increasing, which isn't the case for a lot of other heart conditions that we've done a better job of preventing. Um, but the really important reason we care about atrial fib is not so much of the problems it causes directly, but because of its complications. Uh, and, and by far the biggest complication we're concerned about is strokes. And of course, strokes are always very serious. You know, they can lead to permanent disability or even worse in some cases. Um, and of course, strokes come for many different reasons. You know, uh, they come from high blood pressure. They come from different types of blood clots in different locations. But unfortunately, one place they can also come from is atrial fibrillation. Um, so by properly diagnosing and treating atrial fibrillation, we can actually prevent a significant number of strokes, which is obviously important to the patient who suffers from it, but also important to our population overall because of so much, uh, such, uh, you know, dreaded consequences of, 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 of what happens after you suffer a stroke. So that's the real reason we care so much about AFib, and that's why we're going to talk today about how we diagnose it and how we, how we can prevent complications such as stroke. So uh, most of you, if you've been to the doctor and, and had to deal with either suspected or known heart issues, you've probably talked a little bit about the heart and circulation system with your doctor. And of course, many of you have health backgrounds, I know, uh, from knowing a few of you. Um, but let's just review a little bit about how the heart works and what leads to irregular heart rhythms. So we have to remember that our heart, the most basic concept of a heart is that it's basically a pump. Uh, and it's a muscular pump, so it's made out of muscle, just like the muscles in our arms and legs, uh, with a few key differences. Uh, but in the end, the goal of the heart is to pump blood uh, to all of our vital organs, our muscles, of course, our brain, our kidneys, our lungs. And importantly, the heart has to pump blood to itself, because being a working muscle, it needs its own blood supply. Of course, the purpose of delivering blood is to provide oxygen, and the nutrients that our, that our body needs uh, for daily function. Um, so the way the heart accomplishes its job as a pump is, is a somewhat sophisticated way of passing the blood through multiple chambers in the heart. Uh, and we have something in our heart called valves. Uh, 
which control the flow of blood through our heart. We have a left and a right side of our heart because it turns out that you know one side is, is, uh, uh, has the charge of pumping blood to the lungs, and then the left side of our heart is, is the part that pumps blood to the rest of our body. So there's actually four chambers in the heart. There's two lower chambers, which are the actual pumps themselves, and we call those ventricles. And then there's the upper chambers. Uh, and the job of the upper chambers is to gather the blood to prime the pump so it can be pumped forward. And those upper chambers have the name uh, of atria, or a single one is called an atrium. But when we use the plural in Latin, we call them atria. Uh, and it turns out another job of the upper chamber of the heart is also to generate the heartbeat. And the heartbeat is basically an electrical signal. It's an electrical signal that travels through the heart in a certain sequence uh, and its job is to cause the different chambers to, to pump in a special order to effectively get the blood forward. And, uh, and this electrical signal happens every, with every heartbeat. Uh, and in fact, uh, of course, the heart can't stop beating, or it leads to serious problems. So our heart beats 60 to 80 times a minute, uh, which is uh, you know, several uh, thousand times per hour uh, for our whole life, which is pretty amazing. And all of that has to be regulated by an electrical system that controls the sequence of beats. And so amongst all the other tissue in our heart, like the muscle pump and so forth, there's electrical tissue, what we call nerves, basically, who carry electrical signals. And it's important in our heart that those signals go in a specific sequence and in a specific uh, path. Now, that's how the normal heart works, but unfortunately, uh, if this electrical system becomes diseased, then we can have extra signals, we can have delayed signals, we can have crisscross signals. And one important way in which those signals get crisscrossed is when they start in the top chamber or the atrium. And, uh, and instead of coming at a nice regular uh, beat, uh, in some patients, or for some reason in some hearts, those signals become erratic, and we call that a fibrillation. And when it starts in the top of the heart, we call that atrial fibrillation. So that's where the name comes from. So atrial fibrillation is basically one type of irregular heart rhythm uh, that originates in the top part of the atrium of the heart. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously the scientists and physicians who've studied atrial fib over the years uh, and decades have learned a lot about it, about how it starts, what causes it to happen, excuse me, how it propagates, and what it can do to your heart. But the important thing for you to know is that uh, atrial fib uh, can be very serious in certain situations, and your body can actually tolerate it pretty well in other situations. In fact, sometimes it can happen without any symptoms at all. Uh, for example, you, maybe you've had the experience or someone in your family has where they go in to see the doctor for a regular checkup. And maybe the doctor puts a stethoscope on the chest and hears that the heartbeat is irregular. Or maybe the doctor does an EKG because, you know, just as a checkup or maybe because you're having a procedure like surgery. And then suddenly the EKG happens to show an abnormality like atrial fib. Uh, so we know for sure that in many patients it causes no symptoms at all. Uh, but the reason we care about atrial fibrillation, as I was saying earlier, is that if it goes unchecked, it can definitely lead to complications, one of which I mentioned, which is strokes. But another complication that can occur if it were to go untreated for a while is something called heart failure. So heart failure is basically the fact that the heart's not pumping efficiently and it can't keep up with the demands of the body. Uh, and many different conditions cause heart failure, like having a heart attack, for example. But in this case, atrial fibrillation can as well. And that's the second reason why we would want to treat it, even if it's not necessarily causing symptoms in a particular patient. Um, and, 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 and that's basically what guides our decision as a doctor to recommend certain medications for atrial fib. Um, now, atrial fib is just one type of heart condition as we discussed, and as you probably know, there's many other types of heart disease. And unfortunately, in a lot of patients, these can exist together. Uh, so for example, someone can have high blood pressure for many years, uh, 
And as that high blood pressure affects the heart, it can put strain on the electrical system and cause atrial fibrillation. So sometimes those two conditions go together. Sometimes somebody has another serious heart condition like a heart attack, or what we call a myocardial infarction. And after the heart attack, uh, because the heart is weak, once again, there can be strain on the electrical system and that can lead to the same condition. So there's actually several other conditions that contribute to atrial fib. And when we diagnose the condition or we see it on an EKG, we, ha we as a physician have to look for these other conditions because sometimes the best way to treat the atrial fib is to treat whatever condition is causing it. So I, I suspect if you or your family members have suffered from AFib, there's probably a pretty good chance that may, they may ha you or they may have high blood pressure as well because those are very two common conditions that go together. And sometimes treating the high blood pressure properly is the best way to prevent the atrial fib from coming back or getting worse. Some of the other things we are concerned about uh, uh, in particular is uh, other types of heart uh, issues like valve problems, for example. If, if you have a leaky heart valve or a narrowed heart valve, that can also cause atrial fib. Um, and, uh, and then finally, you know, coronary disease, which is the main type of heart disease. That's the type of heart disease that leads to hardening of the arteries and blockages in the arteries and eventually can lead to heart attacks. That can also exist as well. But there's also some important conditions that don't originate in the heart that can still cause atrial fib. Uh, and, and one of the most important categories is lung conditions, or what we call pulmonary diseases, like asthma and emphysema. But one of the most common conditions we see now that's increasing in a frequency that often doesn't get diagnosed easily is sleep apnea. And as a cardiologist, I can tell you that many times when a family doctor or someone refers us a patient because they di diagnosed atrial fib and they're trying to figure out what the cause is, many, many times after you talk to the patient carefully, you find out that you know, they snore a lot or their, they or their spouse mentions that they have irregular breathing at night, and, and that's a condition called sleep apnea, uh, in which uh, during the night, your uh, muscles around your airways kind of relax and weaken, and then eventually you get some uh, interruption of airflow in those airways, and that leads to irregular breathing. It eventually leads to uh, <coughs> snoring as well, and uh, it can actually have very serious consequences if it goes untreated because the oxygen levels in your body can drop pretty significantly. Um, and it turns out that that drop in oxygen puts strain on your heart and that leads to atrial fib. Uh, so we always try to ask about that if we're trying to figure out why somebody would just develop atrial fib and there's no other obvious cause. Um, and so if you have irregular sleep habits or your spouse say that, you know, they notice that you breathe irregularly or even stop breathing for a few seconds at night, it's definitely worth mentioning to your doctor to see if you need to be checked for sleep apnea. Um, <clears throat> one other important thing that causes atrial fib is our uh, diet and lifestyle. And it turns out that just like certain conditions can put strain on our heart, so can certain foods and beverages. Uh, now... No one has ever known for sure that things like caffeine or coffee directly cause AFib, but we know that caffeine can be a potent stimulant uh, on our heart. And as a result, uh, just like other stimulants, it can potentially cause irregular heart rhythms like atrial fib. Now, if somebody drinks one or two cups of coffee a day, that's probably not the case. But, you know, some people who drink six, eight, ten cups of coffee a day, they're probably putting their heart at risk. Uh, for atrial fib. <clears throat> and then finally, an important thing in our diet that also contributes is alcohol. So we don't even know exactly why, but in patients, not, not those who drink you know, a drink or two a day, but patients who he heavily drink alcohol, uh, there seems to be a direct effect on the muscle in our heart that can lead to these irregular rhythms. Uh, so that's an important thing we ask about, once again, as somebody who has atrial fib is, you know, do you drink alcohol and how much? Uh, in fact, uh, when atrial fib was first described uh, many decades ago, uh, it actually had the nickname holiday heart syndrome because doctors in emergency rooms would notice that uh, right after Christmas or New Year's or Thanksgiving, people would come in with atrial fib the next day. 
and then they would find out that they were celebrating with their family and had a little bit extra wine and so forth. Um, and emergency rooms would know that and expect the patients. Uh, so it was actually called holiday heart syndrome back in the day um, for that reason. Now, in addition to those conditions that directly cause atrial fib, we also have things called risk factors. These are conditions that don't directly cause something else, but they contribute to it. And of course, risk factors are important for all types of heart disease, because even the more serious types like heart attack and coronary disease, uh, we know there are certain risk factors that predispose you to developing that. That doesn't mean it directly causes it, but there seems to be a relationship. It turns out the same risk factors that cause other heart problems can predispose you to atrial fib as well. Some of the important ones we talked about, like high blood pressure, um, other types of heart disease like valvular disease, uh, diabetes, which is you know, not directly a heart condition, but is a condition in which, uh, as you may know, you have high blood sugar readings because your body either uh, doesn't make enough insulin or, uh, or can't process the sugar you eat. Uh, that, that condition, diabetes, of course, leads to different types of heart conditions, including AFib. Uh, so these are other things we would ask the patient or their family about uh, if they have uh, symptoms of an irregular um, heart condition. So let's just talk about the typical symptoms of atrial fib because this is often a challenge to you and your doctor because many of the symptoms of atrial fib are very similar to other heart conditions and sometimes they're very similar to conditions that aren't so serious. Um, but by far and away the most common symptom of an ir any irregular heart rhythm, including AFib, is what we call a palpitation. And a palpitation kind of means different things to different people, but we mostly think of a palpitation as basically being aware of your heartbeat. And that usually means that it's either more forceful than usual or it's faster than usual. And so what the patient would typically say is, you know, I felt fine and then I felt this fluttering in my chest because my heart was pounding hard. Or it was just pounding really fast and, he, and I was just sitting there doing nothing, but it, felt like I had just, you know, uh, ran a mile or something. So we call that a palpitation, and it's really kind of a group of different symptoms, but far and away, that would be the one thing most patients would notice first uh, if they had uh, either atrial fib or a different irregular heart rhythm. And of course, that's why it's so hard sometimes for the doctor to make a diagnosis, because palpitations can come for lots of different reasons. Um, in fact, some people have palpitations uh, on a daily basis, or they have them just from something stimulating their heart, like caffeine use after a cup of coffee, uh, or they have them due to more benign conditions, like just isolated skipped heartbeats, for example, uh, as well. But obviously the doctor, along with the help of some testing, like an EKG, should be able to sort that out. But palpitations, for sure, are the most common symptom we would look for. Uh, but the other ones we look for, which are also potentially serious, would include you know, difficulty breathing or what we call shortness of breath, uh, sometimes you can get actual chest pain from atrial fib uh, or pressure, not just the palpitation, which is the irregular beat, but an actual discomfort or pressure feeling. And of course, chest pain is important because other heart conditions can present with chest pain as well. Uh, and there's some other things like weakness. Uh, lightheadedness is another one because if your heart is beating irregular or fast, sometimes it's not pumping properly and that can cause the patient to faint or feel lightheaded. Um, and obviously, if you feel very lightheaded, there's usually something wrong. Uh, that's not something you would you know, normally feel day to day. Uh, so that kind of uh, would make us think that something more serious is going on, especially if the patient actually faints or passes out. Uh, then that's an even more serious situation if it's coming from an irregular heartbeat. Uh, and then finally, one important system, symptom is just fatigue. Of course, you know, most of us feel fatigued at certain times. I do myself, and I'm sure anyone you ask would say there's times when they feel very tired. But if you're unusually tired, you know, if, even if you had a good night's sleep and you get up the next day and you just feel like you can't do anything or don't want to, you know, many different things can cause that. But of course, one thing we think about is a heart condition or an irregular heart rhythm. And in some patients, that might be the only symptom they have because maybe they're not that active, for example, so they don't do enough activity to have other symptoms, sometimes it's just a fatigue or tiredness that can be a clue that there's something going on.
As we were saying earlier, there are some patients who just have no symptoms from their irregular heartbeat. We're not really sure why. It might have to do with how long you've had it, so you've kind of adapted to it. It might have to do with how sensitive you are to uh, various symptoms. Uh, I'm sure you have people in your family who complain of a different pain every day, uh, and then you have other people you know who never complain. Um, and that may be the same case with, with uh, irregular heart rhythms. Some people are just more sensitive than others and are aware of it. Um, and then some people, as I said, are so sedentary and a inactive that they don't do enough activity to get symptoms. Uh, so, so we call that asymptomatic atrial fibrillation. Asymptomatic means without symptoms. Um, and this is important because this is why some people with the condition, it can be picked up, you know, incidentally when they happen to have an EKG for some, you know, when they're in for surgery, for example, or when they're in for a checkup and their doctor just happens to listen to their heart and notice that it sounds abnormal. Uh, and unfortunately, just because it's not causing symptoms doesn't mean it can't still have complications. And in fact, a lot of patients who have uh, something dramatic like a stroke or a mini stroke, if we look carefully at their history or do an EKG, we may find that they were having atrial fib and didn't even know it. Um, so that's why it's so important to look for that uh, because they are still at risk of having complications. So we have different ways to classify atrial fib, and this is really more important to doctors than anyone else because it helps us decide the right treatment. But the important thing for you is to understand that some patients have atrial fib intermittently and some have it continuously or permanently. Um, and, uh, and we're not, once again, not really sure why it's different in different people, but uh, it turns out that in younger people who tend to develop atrial fib, and unfortunately, this is a condition that affects the young. Um, I used to, when I was uh, 20 years ago, when I was a resident, uh, you know, uh, just out of medical school, there was another resident I worked with who, if he uh, had stayed up all night on call or uh, gotten a little too excited, his heart would flip up to a heart rate of 140, and he would go do an EKG on himself, and he was in atrial fib. And then he would cough hard or drink a glass of cold water, and it would go away. Of course, he never went to the doctor, but... You know, doctors are the worst patients, right? <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so, so young people can have atrial fib that tends to come and go. In other words, it's episodic. You know, maybe something triggers it, it goes away on its own, or maybe they need to get medical care for it to resolve. Uh, whereas other people, it becomes what we call persistent or eventually something called permanent atrial fib. And that's basically atrial fib that's, you know, maybe been there so long that the heart's just adapted to it and... Uh, and the patients adapted to it to the point where, you know, with medications alone, they can manage pretty well uh, and, uh, and not have a lot of symptoms and other, or other problems. So, you know, we classify that that way to help us decide the right treatment. Um, obviously, what's important to the patient is whether they're having this all the time or, or it's episodic. So, uh, as some of you probably know that have had to deal with this condition and other heart issues, you know, there are a multitude of tests we use to diagnose either atrial fib or other heart conditions. And this is really something you would discuss with your doctor in more detail if this was something that either you were being treated for or it was suspected. But obviously the basic way we diagnose most heart conditions is by listening to the heart through a stethoscope and then using some simple tools to give us more information. And of course, the simplest tool that's been around the longest is the EKG or electrocardiogram. And this is basically just a uh, electrical reading of your heart. So obviously that's gonna be the best way to diagnose an electrical problem like atrial fib. Uh, and really it's the test that confirms that that's what type of irregular heart rhythm is going on versus a different one as well. Of course, an EKG like that is only useful if it happens to be done while you're having the episode of the fibrillation. And in some people, that's a challenge because maybe you only have an episode every week or every month. Maybe it lasts a few minutes and goes away. Um, and so doing an EKG in between may not show the problem. There's also many you know, fancier and more advanced tests that uh, we can use to get additional information about your heart. And of course, if you've unfortunately had to deal with heart issues, you know about many of these tests or, or your family members as well. Um, one of them is an ultrasound of the heart called an echocardiogram, which is a very useful test where we use sound waves to take pictures of your heart. Um, 
Many of you have probably had to deal with stress tests where you walk on a treadmill with an EKG to see if the exercise you know, shows any strain on your heart as well. Uh, and then there's all types of other tests, nuclear scans and, and so forth as well. Some of these are directly for the AFib, and some of them are to look for other conditions that could be causing it, like a coronary problem or a leaky heart valve, for example. So uh, we'll talk a little bit of just about your healthcare team and, and talk a little about questions you should ask your doctor if you're either diagnosed with atrial fib or someone in your family is. Um, and then we'll finish up by talking about treatment, and then we'll get into questions and answers. So, uh, uh, you know, there are many different physicians who have to deal with atrial fibrillation, um, and it's often diagnosed by a family doctor, by a internal medicine doctor, maybe by an emergency room doctor uh, as well, and sometimes other physicians. Uh, however, most patients with atrial fib ultimately need to at least be seen by a cardiologist because, uh, because the treatment can be very complicated in terms of different medications, not to mention even other procedures that can be used to treat AFib. And so usually the best person to guide that is a cardiologist. Now, some of you who've had to deal with cardiologists know that there's many types of cardiologists as well. For example, I'm a general cardiologist, so I do consultations, I do hospital rounds, I do a lot of testing. Uh, but we actually have cardiologists who specialize in treating irregular heart rhythms and, and specialize in the heart's electrical system. And the term for that is electrophysiologist, uh, or sometimes they're called an EP physician. Now, what's important to know is that these are cardiologists. So they're just cardiologists who've done extra training uh, to uh, specialize specifically in irregular heart rhythms. And that means they implant pacemakers and defibrillators, and they do specialized tests of the electrical system uh, as well. So most teams, heart care teams, like in our practice, for example, at Riverside, you know, we have general cardiologists and we also have electrophysiologists. We actually have six or seven just at Riverside in our practice because these conditions are so common. And so most patients who have an irregular heart rhythm that's more serious, like atrial fib, may at some point in time see a general cardiologist or an electrophysiologist or both, depending on what treatment and stuff they need. Um, but as specialists, we always are working in partnership with the primary care doctor. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, because for most of these conditions, the best treatment is really going to be a collaboration between specialist and a family doctor who may see you more often and may have a better knowledge of your other conditions. Um, of course, any of you that deal with cardiology offices know that there's many more important people in the office beyond just the physician themselves. Uh, one of the most important people is the uh, cardiology nurse because our nurses deal with heart conditions on a daily basis and, of course, they uh, specifically deal with office space heart issues on a daily basis, and most atrial fib is treated in the office as well. So the nurse is very important uh, for you to develop a relationship with, to understand what your condition is, and for you to be able to reach easily and quickly if you have questions about medications, about tests, and so forth. Um, because many patients with atrial fib are on multiple medications, Pharmacist is important as well because uh, they're going to be the best resource to explain what the medication is for, how it interacts with other medications, the best time to take it, and so forth. And then, of course, most of us uh, uh, try to rely on friends and family to deal with these more complicated issues like treating heart conditions as well. So uh, we have some advice about what to do when you have to go to the physician, maybe for a known heart condition or maybe with symptoms where it's being suspected. Um, most of these things I think most patients understand now to bring, you know, your medications with you, not just what medications you're on, but the doses and how you're taking them and who prescribed them. Uh, bring in a list of your past uh, medical conditions. Remember, even if we're questioning you about a heart condition, we really want to know your whole health history because so much is interrelated and so many heart issues can either impact other systems or be a consequence of it. Um, so uh, you should be prepared to, to give that history either for you or your family members. And of course, ideally bringing a family member is best because uh, they're going to think of questions you may not. 
and vice versa. So these are some questions you would want to ask your physician or advanced practitioner when you see them. Um, uh, these deal specifically with atrial fib, but some of them apply to other heart conditions as well. Uh, one would be, do I need to be on a blood thinner uh, uh, to prevent a stroke? And if so, what type? Uh, do I need any procedures for my atrial fib to uh, get my heart rhythm back to normal? Um, has the atrial fib weakened my heart in some way? Uh, and how do we know that? Um, what are the right medications I should be taking to control the condition? What kind of activities can I perform? Are there any restrictions on exercise or other activities? And then what can I do to prevent the condition? So can I change my diet? Can I change my activity? Can I work on other goals like weight loss? Even better sleep habits. All those things are important potentially to reduce the recurrence rate. <clears throat> And of course, you know, your clinician should be, will then be asking you a lot more detailed questions about your specific history. When did the symptoms start? Uh, what, what other symptoms do you have with them? Uh, does anything make them better? Does anything seem to bring on the condition? I mean, all those are important things we would ask as a clinician to you or your family member when you come in. So we'll finish off then by talking about treatment uh, for the condition, and then uh, that'll leave us plenty of time uh, for your questions about either this or other issues. So when we treat atrial fib, it's a bit complicated because, number one, we're trying to treat the condition now and get you or your family member who's affected feeling better, but we're also focused on preventing complications. And like I said, the two biggest complications are heart failure and stroke. So our treatment is geared at all those things. There's really three, three uh, components of treating this condition. One is to just reduce the heart rate. So atrial fib, like a lot of other uh, heart conditions or irregular rhythms, causes your heart to speed up. Uh, and it can speed up very fast, and it can sometimes speed up dangerously fast to the point where you might faint or pass out. So one of the fastest ways we can get someone feeling better and, of course, uh, reduce their acute risk is to get their heart rate controlled, either by pills, or sometimes in an emergency room or hospital through IV medication. Um, the next important thing is preventing complications like stroke, and that's why we use blood thinners. And, and uh, of course, we have many different blood thinners we use in, in medical care. Some are given through the IV, like heparin. Uh, some are given as an injection. And then many are given as pills. Uh, and I think we're going to talk in a few minutes about the specific types of blood thinners that would be used for this condition. Um, obviously, if a patient's at risk of having a blood clot from their atrial fib, the sooner you start the blood thinners, the sooner you'll reduce the risk. And then the third goal of treatment is to get their heart rhythm back to normal. Because obviously, uh, if someone's having symptoms from their atrial fib or we're worried about complications, one of the best ways to improve that is to get their heart back to normal rhythm. And we have different ways to do that as well. We can do that with medications. Or we can do that with procedures to resynchronize the heart back to normal rhythm. So when, if you're in the emergency room with this condition or even at your doctor's office, they'll be thinking about all these different things as they recommend various treatments. So this just talks about the different medications I just discussed. Uh, there's several categories of medication we would use for atrial fib based on what our goal is. Of course, the blood thinners are the important ones for preventing clots. Sometimes we use medications to restore your heart rhythm. We call those antiarrhythmic drugs. That means they're a drug that's used to counteract an irregular rhythm or arrhythmia. Uh, and, uh, and there's many different medications that can be used for that that we use in cardiology. And maybe you'll have questions about a few specific ones. Um, and then there's other medicine that doesn't really restore the heart to normal rhythm, but it just focuses on lowering the pulse rate. And we have a few medications for that purpose as well. You might be familiar with some of them, like Cardizem, uh, Verapamil, Metoprolol, uh, Digoxin even works for that. These are all medications that lower your pulse rate, and they help with the symptoms. So uh, of course, one of the most important treatments for atrial fib is preventing strokes due to blood clots. And, 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 uh, and this class of medications that we kind of refer to as blood thinners, the, the, the true name for that is anticoagulants. So these are basically medications that prevent clots or reduce the risk or likelihood of clots forming in the blood.
And uh, so warfarin has been around for decades. You know, we have a lot of experience using it in medicine. Uh, it basically thins all of your blood, so it prevents, it, it's used to treat lots of different types of blood clots. Blood clots in your legs, blood clots in your lungs. In this case, we're using it to prevent blood clots in your heart due to the atrial fib. Of course, uh, warfarin is given as a pill. You know, it doesn't come as an IV. Uh, so it only comes as a pill that's taken once a day. And if any of you have had to be on warfarin or have family members, you know that one of the uh, real negatives about that medication is that you have to check blood levels to monitor how thin your blood is. And the reason is, is that a, the same dose of warfarin can affect different people in different ways. So it can thin the blood too much, which would put you at risk of having bleeding problems, or it can not thin the blood enough. And if that's the case, then it's really not treating anything, and you would still be at risk of having a blood clot. So as a result, we have to uh, check a blood level of how thin your blood is. The name of that blood test that you may have heard of is called an INR, which is just a fancy name for uh, international normalized ratio. It's basically a, a ratio of how thin your blood is now compared to normal. So like an INR of two basically means your INR is twice as, I'm sorry, your blood is about twice as thin as somebody uh, who didn't have any medicine in their system. Three means it's three times as thin. So that's a very useful test, and it's very easy to do. You know, as you probably know, it just takes a small blood sample. Now it can even be done with a finger stick uh, by someone at home using a kit. Um, however, it's still a hassle because you have to check that periodically, sometimes even every day or every week, uh, or usually at least every month if you take warfarin therapy. Uh, so the INR is that test. Uh, because warfarin is such a hassle to use, and because you know, it affects different people in different ways, uh, we've worked hard to develop alternate blood thinners that are better than warfarin. And now in the last, just in the last five to seven years, we've have been able to develop alternate anticoagulants um, that do the same thing as warfarin. They prevent clots, but they're either easier to give or at least they don't require any blood monitoring because they give the same amount of blood thinning in every patient. Um, and we now have three of these that we use here in the United States. Um, uh, one is, uh, the first one that was available was uh, Pradaxa, which is uh, Dibigatran is the generic name. Uh, the next one was uh, Zarelto, which I think is called Rivaroxaban. I, I don't know where they think of these names for these medications, you know. Uh, they should consult with an English teacher or someone before they invent these new generic names for some of these medicines. But, uh, and now there's a third one as well, uh, uh, Eliquis. So these are, all, uh, these are all newer medications that do the same thing as warfarin, but the big advantage is you don't need to check any blood levels. Uh, so it's just simply easier to give. Some of them are given once a day, like Pradac, uh, I'm sorry, like Xeralto, and the others are given twice a day. That just has to do with how long they last in your system. Uh, so, so they're a big advantage, of course, over warfarin, but unfortunately, being new medications, they're also expensive because there's no generic versions and so forth. So, uh, so the decision to use one of those newer agents versus warfarin is kind of an individual decision between the patient and the physician, and you have to take into account how expensive is it, you know, have I had trouble with warfarin before, and so forth. Many patients have taken warfarin for years, and they've done very well on it. Uh, and for them, there may be no reason to switch to something that's just going to be more expensive. Uh, but the important thing to remember is that there are multiple types of blood thinners. Now, there's even other blood thinners that you probably hear about uh, as well that treat other conditions, but they're not so useful for atrial fib. And one of the most common blood thinners we recommend is aspirin. You know, even though aspirin is a pain reliever, of course, it also acts as a mild blood thinner. And so many patients with heart conditions especially uh, coronary problems like heart attacks or those who have stents and take aspirin as a blood thinner. It turns out aspirin works for atrial fib, but it doesn't work nearly as well as warfarin. So, uh, so it, it's better than taking nothing uh, in terms of preventing strokes and blood clots, but it's not nearly as potent as taking warfarin or one of these new medications. So in general, if we feel someone's at risk of having a blood clot or a stroke, 
we would recommend uh, one of these medications and not just aspirin. However, as you know, maybe dealing with family members or others, sometimes patients have had bleeding problems from a blood thinner, maybe they've had stomach bleeds or other types of complications, and maybe the doctor's recommended you shouldn't take a potent blood thinner like Coumadin for that reason. And if that's the case, then aspirin may be you know, a safer alternative and, and better than not taking any medication. And so many elderly patients, you know, because they're at risk of falling or they've had bleeding problems, we might decide to just recommend aspirin alone rather than warfarin for that reason. So we'll finish then by talking about a few procedures to treat atrial fib. So the medication is usually the first step, but because, you know, the patient may still have symptoms or we're worried about their ongoing risk of having a complication, we may want to put the patient back into a normal rhythm. And if those medications alone don't do the job, then we have to resort to other techniques. And the most common technique to restore a heart to normal rhythm is called a cardioversion. And a cardioversion is actually a procedure where we use electrical energy to resynchronize the heartbeat. Now, of course, uh, cardioversion with you know, defibrillators and so forth are used to treat many different serious conditions. The most serious condition, of course, is when your heart stops beating altogether, maybe from a heart attack or so forth. We call that, you know, a, a cardiac arrest. And, of course, the defibrillator is one treatment for that because it re, kind of resynchronizes the heart immediately back into a normal rhythm. Well, that same thing can be used for atrial fib, but, you know, it can be done in a more controlled setting with a lower amount of energy, and it basically takes a little bit of sedation or a little shot of anesthetic, uh, and then it can safely be done in just a few seconds. And it has a pretty high success rate of getting the heart back to normal rhythm. The problem is, is that uh, even after you get the heart to normal rhythm, atrial fib is a very stubborn condition, and it tends to come back in a lot of patients. Uh, in fact, after a procedure like a cardioversion, about 50% of the patients will have a recurrence of the atrial fib in the next year. So unfortunately, we can treat it pretty well, but preventing it from coming back is, a, is more of a challenge. And that has, may have to do with the other conditions that are causing it, like high blood pressure or sleep apnea um, or, or whatever. Uh, so the cardioversion works well, but it doesn't always end the condition, unfortunately. If someone's had a cardioversion and the atrial fib has come back, we have to think about other options to more aggressively try to keep their heart rhythm controlled. And that's when we think about a procedure called ablation. So ablation is a more invasive procedure. You know, a cardioversion is an external procedure, but an ablation is a procedure where we actually pass a catheter into the heart and actually take measurements on the electrical system, figure out where the atrial fib seems to be coming from, and then we apply some energy. It's actually radio frequency energy through a very high-tech system that uh, basically kind of creates a little scar on the heart's electrical system where the uh, er uh, abnormal signal is coming from. And by doing so, it has a pretty high success rate of, of either eliminating the AFib or reducing the frequency. But of course, this is a more invasive procedure, so there's more risk of complications as well. And that's why this wouldn't be our first choice for someone with atrial fib. We generally would use this as an option if they tried multiple medications or they've had cardioversions that haven't worked. Um, but the ablation in some patients can potentially cure the condition. In other patients, even the ablation alone can't prevent it from coming back, and those are patients where we may just have to accept the fact that they're going to stay in the atrial fib permanently, uh, and then just stay on a blood thinner and medication to keep it regulated. And of course, uh, the ablation can sometimes be done through a catheter, but it can actually be done in surgery as well. So maybe you've had to have a, had a family member who's had to have open heart surgery, you know, coronary bypass or a valve placed. Sometimes this uh, ablation can be done in conjunction with it if the patient's known to suffer from irregular heart rhythms. So we just have a few tips to finish up before the questions about, you know, what you can do if either you or a family member suffers from atrial fib to help manage the condition. Obviously, working closely with your health care providers is the most important thing, not just your uh, specialist, but your family doctor, your pharmacist as well. Um, you know, it goes without saying that if a medication has been recommended, then taking it properly and consistently is going to be the best way to keep the condition controlled. 
Uh, and of course, your providers need to know the exact medications you take and, and doses as well. Um, it's important if you've had AFib or you or a family member has it, you understand what a stroke is so that it can be recognized right away if it happens. So remember, a stroke is a, it's a neurologic condition. It's not really a heart condition. Um, and, and it presents with different symptoms. Um, but the most important symptoms of a stroke are sudden weakness in the arms or legs, uh, in the face, an inability to speak even, uh, sudden confusion in somebody who was previously thinking clearly, uh, trouble speaking, trouble walking, because a stroke often affects the muscles that control your coordination and, and physical activity, or sometimes just a very severe headache, uh, because there's different types of strokes some of them present with bleeding, actually, rather than a blood clot, and they can cause a severe headache. So all of these things are things you want to kind of keep in mind if you or a family member is potentially at risk of having a stroke, because it turns out the faster it gets recognized and the faster you get medical attention, uh, the better likelihood of a full recovery. Uh, and we have wonderful techniques now for patients who are in the midst of a stroke to try to minimize the uh, consequences or even eliminate any ongoing symptoms or consequences, but it all relies on early recognition. So you just never want to take a chance with anybody, you or in your family, if they have any of these sudden neurologic type symptoms um, uh, and, and get medical attention right away. So we'll finish by talking about prevention, and this is important to me uh, as, a, as a preventive cardiologist. You know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about how we treat heart conditions. And we have lots of fancy technology uh, to treat all the various heart conditions, but we probably don't spend as much time talking about prevention. Now, it turns out the things we can do to prevent atrial fib are the same things we can do to prevent almost all types of heart disease. Um, and, these, and I don't think any of these are going to be big news to you uh, if you've uh, dealt with medical, uh, the medical system or family doctors over the years. Um, but really, the, the cornerstones of cardiovascular prevention are lifestyle, which means how you eat, how active you are, and whether you maintain your body weight, and then recognizing other conditions that are risks for heart conditions, like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, cigarette smoking, and diabetes. Uh, the important things about diet are a low-sodium diet, because so, you know high sodium intake leads to high blood pressure. Um, and minimizing alcohol use, uh, specifically if you have AFib or you're at risk for it, uh, and caffeine as well. Now, for other types of heart conditions, other things in the diet are important as well, like watching saturated fats, reducing sugar, and processed foods in your diet as well. Uh, and, and, you know, I probably should have said this at the beginning, and maybe you know this, but remember that heart disease is the number one killer of men and women in the United States. Uh, it's not cancer, it's not accidents, it's heart disease. So really, heart, preventing heart disease should be all of our concerns for us and everyone in our family. It has nothing to do with anyone in your family who's had a heart problem before or if you've ever been diagnosed. Um, preventing heart disease is really, uh, should be a priority for all of us uh, as American adults. So, so uh, reducing sugar, reducing saturated fats, sodium, and uh, minimizing alcohol and caffeine are the cornerstones of diet. Um, of course, medications, that's really individualized to each patient, and that's something your doctor would talk to you about, what medications they recommend, why you should take them. Anyone who smokes should try to stop smoking. Uh, this is important for every type of heart condition, not to mention other complications of smoking, like chronic lung disease and lung cancer, for example. Being active is very important because if we're active, we're probably going to maintain our weight better. And we know that as we get overweight, we predispose to other things like high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, and atrial fib as well. And then it turns out there's a strong relationship between stress and uh, chronic disease. So that most patients, or many, who are under chronic stress, either from their work, from their family situations, from life in general, unfortunately, it, it does predispose you to chronic disease, including chronic heart disease. So talking to your family doctor and other people around you about how to minimize or control the stress not only will make you feel better, 
but it'll reduce your risk down the road of other conditions. So, you know, if, if you're here because someone in your family suffers from known or suspected heart condition like atrial fib, uh, then you've probably already learned that you can be a big resource to your family member by helping them through the, navigate them through the medical system, uh, uh, helping them understand their medications and why they take them, uh, helping them watch for certain symptoms like we talked about um, as well. But it's also important that, you know, if you have someone in your family with heart disease, it's important you pay attention yourself. <laughs> Not be because obviously uh, if someone in your family's had a heart condition, you're probably at risk to some degree. And as I said, essentially we're all at risk of heart disease and, and need to watch for that, which means taking care of our own risk factors and, and stuff, not just in our family members. Uh, these are a few questions that I think we covered already about uh, what we would ask for our family members when we seek health care. Um, but uh, if someone has a chronic heart condition that maybe is not, you know, uh, going to go away and may cause permanent disability or symptoms, then there's some other resources your family doctor can help you with uh, for your family member as well that you can discuss. So we'll finish by talking about some programs we're aware of and resources we have for prevention. Um, one of the most important ones is CardioSmart. And CardioSmart is a, uh, you know, it's not a promotional program. It's not run by a hospital system or physicians or a drug company. The CardioSmart is a patient education program promoted by our professional society, which is the American College of Cardiology. Uh, and its mission is purely to educate uh, patients about heart disease. Um, and I think one of the flyers here uh, refers to the CardioSmart website. It has tons of resources. You know, it has videos. It has handouts for you and your family members. It has information about diet, about exercise, about uh, ex explaining you know, common medications and procedures. And I recommend this to my patients frequently uh, as one of the best resources to help them understand heart disease. And then Mended Hearts is an important organization because that's an uh, uh, organization of other patients. So Mended Hearts are, uh, are groups, basically support groups, of patients who've had recovered from heart conditions, who uh, put on you know, sessions and seminars and uh, group meetings to help others deal with this. And it may be something you'd want to explore for you or a family member if they have chronic heart disease. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about our website, which there's a, you may have picked up a flyer about. Uh, our health site, which I put together with my partner, Dr. Albers, who's given the session this evening, uh, is called Heart Health Docs. And, you know, we're both very interested in prevention, and we both realize there's just not a lot of good information on the Internet about heart prevention. Uh, and some of it's misinformation, and some of it's, you know, got, you know, promoted by certain hospitals or, or so forth, or, uh, you know, drug companies. So we wanted to try to collect some of the most useful information we've come across when we educate our patients. So we started this website basically as a blog where we can uh, show you some resources about heart prevention we can go into a lot more detail than we can when we see you in the office about proper diet, role of exercise, you know, how you treat high cholesterol, for example. So you may find that website helpful, and it's completely non-promotional. Non um, and then you'll also see a flyer about a book called The Incredible Human Machine, and that's uh, a book that I was uh, able to contribute to that was written by Dr. Velishami, who's here in the audience. Uh, and that's a, a book specifically written for patients. It's not for professionals or doctors or nurses. It's really a guide for patients about how they can navigate through the different types of uh, chronic disease, not just heart disease, but other types as well. So if you want to get more information about uh, either heart disease or other things, you may find that book helpful as well, along with our website. So uh, I really appreciate your attention. You know, I think we've covered some of these resources already that we have available, like Mended Hearts and CardioSmart. Uh, but there are a lot of resources out there. So, you're, you know, if you or, or someone in your family is suffering from heart disease, you're not alone. You know, unfortunately, your, your, uh, uh, your story is probably similar to a lot of other people's as well. Uh, and, and so finding the support that you need uh, uh, should be, definitely be an option for everyone. So I really appreciate your attention uh, uh, and sitting through this long presentation.
And uh, thanks again, and we'll just have a few minutes here for questions if you'd like. Thanks.